I do, but I keep it in my office. <coughs> You'll have to just pretend, I guess. <laughs> The architects just left the building. Paul? Hmm? The architects just left the building. Oh. We have a hazardous building meeting upstairs hearing in the conference room. Okay, it's three o'clock. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Paul Gamka. Here. Diane Scheib Snyder. Here. Karen Winchester here. Chief Lentz. Here. Uh, George Cullis. Here. Peter Stauffer. Peter Stauffer is absent. Absent. The chair would make a motion to excuse. I support. Support by Paul Gamka. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now the chair would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Moved by Winchester. Is there support? Support. Support by Sean Snyder. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Now the consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial. They do not require discussion by the NACFA board and will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion. If discussion is desired on an item, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will automatically be moved to the last item under new business. I move to approve the consent agenda. Moved by Winchester. Is there support? I'll support it. Support by Gamka. Are we paying bills or we need mm -hmm. a roll call vote? Yes. Uh, Karen Winchester? Yes. Diane Scheib Snyder? Yes. Uh, Paul Gamka? Yes. George Collis? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Reports. We will start with. The chief. Uh, in your agenda were the June and July uh, reports. We didn't have a meeting last month. For June, we had a busy month of 114 calls. Um, for July, we hit a new all time record for calls given a month. The previous record was 122. We had 126 last month. Um, based on the storm that came through last Wednesday, we're more than likely going to way surpass even this July one for August. So we had, uh, we had 80, 80 plus calls um, from 3.30 p.m. when the storm came through last Wednesday through the night into the morning, a couple of stragglers, probably a dozen or so over the next two days. So, uh, they were really um, very busy, um, and most of the people that responded to that were from start to finish. They worked from 
3.30 in the afternoon when it's first hit until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, nonstop. Um, we didn't have any injuries. We did not have um, a report of any um, you know, community people injuries. Um, we did, in the middle of all that chaos, had a structure fire on Fenton Road um, that was more than likely due to uh, a surge, electrical surge that um, started a ceiling fan on fire inside the home and the fire kind of started to get up in the attic, but we were able to uh, knock it down quickly and um, basically no structural damage, just some um, moderate smoke and fire damage to the dining room area. So it was a very busy, uh, busy week last week. Uh, everybody did a great job. Um, dispatch was overwhelmed. Um, we were overwhelmed, but we were able to get everybody to the severe incidents and get them mitigated and um, everybody went home. So would you like me to continue on with my report? Just one quick question yes. for you too. I was adding up the numbers between the total calls for June, which is 114. If I add up the mutual aids, the 25, and I add it to the Rose Township and the Holly Township, it comes up with 110. I, I'm, I'm a numbers guy, and normally numbers are supposed to equal something. I just wonder, what do I miss? Um, if you add Rose Township, Holly Township, and the out-of-district runs, you end up with 110. And we had four calls on I-75, which is part of our district. We just... Didn't. So those are the ones that don't show up. So that would yeah. be the same explanation then for July. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wondered why I always yeah. be missing. Well, we keep track in our um, run reporting system of I seventy five calls separately, just because it's a okay. Just major highway. And Thank you. I don't have to keep mm -hmm. scoping it out every <laughs> month and figuring out what I'm doing wrong. Right. So continue. Uh, I well, already talked about the uh, storm response. Um, I do want to um, bring to the attention we had a we had a run on July 25th down on Evans Road, which is the far north of Halley Township, um, for a, a female that was uh, not acting correctly. Um, we got the call through state police, and when we arrived on scene. Uh, the state police had the girl in custody. Um, we took her up to the hospital. Um, two of our uh, employees that responded to that, uh, Randy Finkbeiner and Sergeant Miller, were out there in their POVs to help out with the scene. Um, after the scene cleared and we got the patient to the hospital, uh, call it intuition, with a little luck, um, Dan and Randy happened to be driving around and came across a car that was parked off to the side of the road with the doors open and the engine still running. Um, this was on Belford Road, which is a whole, whole different area. Um, and after some quick investigation, came to find out that it was this woman's car. Um, and after getting some more information, uh, we found out she had a three-year-old with her that she had left sitting outside the car. Oh, my God. Um, the three-year-old was not around. So um, both Dan and Randy went in to uh, contact Captain Seal just to you know, report what was going on, and we may have to activate the, a search team. Um, they immediately started canvassing the houses nearby and... One of the homes, one of the gentlemen was there at home, uh, just explained what was going on. He went out in the back with his gator or whatever, because you know, those are all like 10 acre, 15 acre parcels out there, and uh, drove around and, and found the child unharmed. So, um, was she just sitting by a tree or something? Just wandering around the, oh. in the field, apparently. Hmm. So it could have been a very, yeah. very bad situation. Um, so kudos to uh, Dan and Randy on that, and um, they will be recognized for that uh, at our banquet, which
which leads me into my, my other reminder of my chief's report that our banquet is this Friday. I think you've all gotten your invites. Um, but I just want it a week. I'm sorry, a week from Friday. <laughs> Not this Friday. A week from Friday, the 27th. <laughs> um, and that is all I had to report. Doug, did you have anything to add? Uh, the only thing is the uh, Renaissance Festival oh, yes. starting this weekend. Starting this weekend. That's what's starting this weekend. Initial uh, surveys gave them the list of items they need to correct, and they're working on them today. They're hampered like everybody else with the rain and wind damage and so forth. So we're going to again have our fire watch will have one and a half people throughout every day that it's open. So in the morning we'll have two people, we go through and check all the cooking equipment, train all of the volunteers that run it, and then we have two people who shut down, and then during the day, it's one person making about two rounds an hour through the building. And you're handling the building. Yes. So, yep. architects to do the drawings for the improvements for our old hall, um, primarily their um, ADA wheelchair access changes. Um, Doug contacted me about the uh, dry hydrant that was put in at Davisburg Road at the new culvert there, and um, I did contact the road commission engineers, and they did contact the contractor to have them tighten where it's leaking. Um, we're going to try and set it up so you guys can be on scene to actually draft test it at that time. Uh, so you can give it approval before they head out. Uh, the, Road Township, the Rose Township Board uh, adopted a, a moratorium for caregivers who grow cannabis for um, getting permits for structure changes, electrical, etc. The Planning Commission is working on a, a draft um, Ordinance at this time that will be added to zoning, and this is for cannabis caregivers. We get multiple calls a day of people asking if we allow it and um, what's happening throughout, I know, Oakland County at least. People are purchasing these homes or they're using them just for growing. Uh, so one of the requirements will be that this is your resident where you're growing. Um, so that's something the planning commissioners will be working on. And you know that when they're growing, there's incredibly heavy electrical demands mm -hmm. and they're using gases and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's not set up for a residential wiring system. Yes, and that is why we have this uh, moratorium at this point. It, mainly, it has a lot to do with you getting building permits for those type of changes. Yeah. Um, like well, I said, I get multiple calls a day on it. And, and a lot of the people that, since they know we have this moratorium, are just waiting to see what we, what our moratorium, um, yeah. you know, has in it. So I did explain to a few people some of the changes that I assume are going to be coming because it's done by the planning commissioners. But um, we suggested as a board to have them look into it and um, wrote a moratorium, you know, for this time. Just for, it's for good, good for six months, and in that time we should have a new ordinance adopted. Um, and the Milford Road at Water Road culvert that's going to be going in is supposed to, was supposed to start Monday. They don't have their signage ready so that won't be happening because they have to have custom made signage and the uh, contractor um, isn't ready yet to do that. So I don't have a date as of now but it's not going to be the date I was originally told like a month ago. And that's going to be a 60-day closure or more, weather permitting. Um, How many days? 60. 60? Mm -hmm. Where is that? Milford? It's just, no, it's just um, south of here. 
Just um, if you go right over the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. it's going to be right there. It's oh. a it's a quick detour route. If you go up water to the mountain. Yeah, they're not closing Water Road. You'll be able to access water. It's just going to get hammered. That's all. Um, I did let deals. Cider Mill know that what's going on. They weren't aware of it, and they have. That's the time they have several events. We got our census report in, and so um, from 2000 to 2010, we went up 40 people, and from 2010 to 2020, we went down 62 people. So that's a, a decrease of, I guess, point zero percent. 1.0%. So um, I was kind of surprised. I thought we'd be in the 6,500 range. We're at 6,188 residents. Uh, SEMCAG does a great job with data. If you want to go and look, I actually printed all of ours and was taking the time to uh, look at it. So if you want to check it out, it's pretty interesting. If you're a uh, graph and number kind of person. You just said you were a number person. Yes, so. We use that as a base model our application programs. Okay. Yeah, and, and that it is very helpful for that. I agree. Well, that's all I have. Okay. Howie Township. Karen? I don't have anything. Okay, so I met with Oakland County Road Commission, um, talked about the roads in Howie, oh, and uh, part of that conversation was the um, paving of Quick Road from Fagan all the way over to Fish Lake Road. Um, they are going to be working up some projected numbers so that I can take it to our board and talk about it. Um, just so you understand, that's a project that would be, first of all, it has to be township funded because it's not a um, primary road, uh, which I had that discussion and I still don't understand how they determine that. but. Um, the thought was it's such a good bypass for the Grange Hall traffic that's in there in the afternoon. That and with the subdivisions that are coming up Riverside North, uh, there's a lot of traffic that could be on Quick Road, but instead they choose to go through Mill Point and through the subdivisions because they don't want to go out on the dirt roads. Um, that's the kind of project that's probably six years away, even if it were to happen. Um, but I thought you can't really make those decisions until you take a look at them and have some numbers in front of you. Interestingly enough, uh, from North Holly Road to Fish Lake Road is about a mile, and from Fish Lake Road to Fagan Road is a mile. So it makes it convenient to have uh, two separate projects if need be. Um, we also talked about um, doing some, um, I'm not sure I know what word I'm after, the apron or the entrances to like Laring Road and Belford Road because people are hitting them at a high speed and, and moving the gravel around. So we had that conversation along with, um, on a longer term, uh, the reality that uh, someday Root Road would be paved from East Holly Road over to Grange Hall Road. And especially if you add another 500 homes into Holly Hills you would have that traffic up there. So they talked about that as well. So there were a couple of different um, parts of it. Uh, and, and that route road takes in part of Fagan because that's where they're going to have a you know, entrance and exit off of there. So those are just some of the things that were discussed um, while they're there. They're going to be replacing two culverts on Fish Lake Road, um, but those aren't supposed to happen until next year. It's between um, Grange Hall and Academy, so, uh, north of the tracks. There's two in there. We will be picking up um, a longer culvert, which will allow a walkway on the east side of the road. So that's nice, because we have a lot of people fishing off of those sides of the road over there. That'll give them a place to stand so they're not right out in the road. And you have the kayakers. Safe. Well, and, and that's <coughs> going to get started. Uh, Sue Julian just got their permits from Eagle to start that project. Um, they have their money in-house, and they're currently working with engineers on that project as well. Um, our citizen at large isn't here. We don't have any present presentations or unfinished business, so we'll move right on to new business. 
health and safety policies. Um, I will turn to the chief. So in your packet are three um, health and safety policies, two of which, the bloodborne pathogens and the TB exposure control program, these are policies that have been in place for years. Um, I just, when I got into creating the third policy, I came across these and just saw that they needed to be updated for grammar or just updated. Um, so there's not any really any big changes in any of these, just some small revisions, um, just so we can show that they have been updated recently when we get this audit, when we get audited on this stuff by our the insurance company and stuff. So, um, do you want to point out the changes on the bloodborne pathogen and the tuberculosis? There really isn't any. I just went through and made sure everything was uh, if there was any spelling corrections. Um, I think there was some some stuff that referenced uh, people and places that we had years ago that no longer exist. So, we like changed those. There's, there was no changes to any of the actual. Um, substance. substance of it. Uh, like the contact information was updated for our current uh, training and safety officers and stuff like that. So none of the actual policy language was changed. Um, we just, uh, because we have to show that they've been reviewed every so often and updated with, you know, updated dates and stuff um, and approved. So uh, I don't know if the board wants to just uh, that for the first motion or whatever to get that out of the way and then we can talk about obviously this third policy which is a newly created one. Okay. Um, I guess my concern is that anytime we're going to vote to change something from a standpoint of transparency we should be able to see the old and the new so that we're clear on what those changes are. I'm, I, I just think that should be a normal part of policy. No, I, I understand that. Um, I, I can put this on the burner until next month, but I will tell you that the only thing that was changed was a couple of spelling errors and the contact information and, and, that's and on the back. I don't doubt that. It isn't an issue of, of trust. I'm just saying no, from I, the standpoint I, of I public it. policy, if we're changing this, we should see it's going from this to this, the red line kind of thing. And then it's much clearer. I had the same thought, George. Actually, I went back after I printed it, because I printed it from a black and white printer, and I actually went back to see, like, is any of this in a different color or red or anything, um, to what you sent us, because I had the same thought. Well, I don't know what was changed. I just think from a standpoint of transparency, that's a, we have an obligation to the public. That's fine. We can... We can re so we'll we table revisit this, this yeah, next month fine. then. I'd make a motion that we table this till next month to see the differences. So I, I will just include the originals with the uh, next month's. I would support. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Then we're going to talk about the new one, right? I, yep. Yes. The chief just dealt with those two. So now we go on to the third. All right. Understanding that this is a controversial uh, topic, um, I've done much research on it. I have been for months now. Um, I've been coming up with uh, all the stuff through the FDA and CDC on this um, based on the science, based on the data, not, um, you know, the rhetoric and the social media and the, the stuff that sometimes gets taken out of context, based on the fact that uh, probably about 20 of our people are fully vaccinated and have been since December without issues, um, based, I'm sorry, what? Based on the fact that um, we, as the first responder healthcare providers that are the first line going in to sick people, into unknown environments, into homes, into cars, and uh, yeah, um, based that 
the people that have been vaccinated, myself included, um, have not contracted the virus, have not had any medical issues with this. Um, based on April's outbreak that we had with those individuals that had not been vaccinated at that point, which uh, strung us out to almost uh, no crews on a couple of nights and cost us uh, around $20,000 that month in overtime that we had to pay to try to shore up the 12 people that uh, got knocked out for weeks on end that month. Um, this was gone over with the uh, labor attorney. In fact, we used, I used the uh, gentleman that had come out from the Bodman law firm for the other thing um, that had been sending me some information because they are dealing with this on a daily basis with the clients they represent. He's reviewed this. Um, he said there was no issues with it. Um, again, I realize it's a controversial topic. I, I just, I was on the fence with this for a long time. It wasn't an easy decision to make. But again, after researching everything, after looking at, at where we are, what we provide, our, our employees, the people that we provide care to, the environments that we get into, um, the uh, integrity that it has on this department from a financial and manpower standpoint, uh, I, I think that it's best that we um, have a COVID-19 mandatory vaccination for all of our employees, with the exception of those that obviously get exemptions under the allowed exemptions. What would that be? Uh, one of them is medical. So if they have some kind of a medical issue, underlying issue, an immune system issue, something that prevents them from having this, that is an exceptional. And there's paperwork and forms that they fill out to do that. Um, along with, you know, physician letters and stuff like that. Uh, the other one is the religious exemption, which uh, is a very limited exemption. It's very, it, it's, it's very in-depth. Um, you have to, to prove that, you know, this is your lifestyle and that you've never had vaccinations. And it's a very, very in-depth thing that has to get filled out with, um, you know, um, it's almost essay questions on, on some of the, the forms to fill out. It, it's something that uh, does not happen all that often, according to the attorneys. Um, a, a, a religious exemption request is, is something that's very hard to prove. And I mean, there are people that can prove it, but uh, more than that, it's not something that people attempt to get exempt from. Um, ultimately, board members, it's uh, your decision. Um, I do know that the majority of the department is in favor of it, but there are people that aren't, and we are going to have a few people that are adamant um, that you know they will not, at least at this time, um, go through with us. So they have that right, and they and they do. They absolutely do. And again, I. I'm not one to think that other careers, people that work at General Motors, people that work in the township office, I, I don't believe that this should be something that, that's mandatory in that aspect. Um, I truly believe that because of what we do and in the environments that what we do it in, that it should be something mandatory for, for, for our type of job description. Well, and I don't think we should even consider it until it's FDA approved. And if the CDC knew what they were talking about, then we wouldn't need the vaccines for people that don't want them because the masks work. So when you go into the environment and the CDC says the mask works, then you shouldn't have an issue. It's, I think it's their body and their choice and that you should never mandate a vaccine ever for anybody. It's unethical. 
And I, and I don't, I don't, well, one, because it says this policy is intended to comply with all state and local laws. There is no laws that mandate vaccines. You're putting something into somebody's body, and there's been, what, 9,000 people that have been known to have died from, from having the, the vaccine. I didn't know that and, 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 and why last would we put ourselves in that kind of liability? 9,400. Really? Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with approving it because it hasn't been fully approved as well. Mm -hmm. And it takes a couple years before you even know what the real results of the vaccine are. We're not even at the beginning stages. Yeah. I, I, think, I think you guys have been lucky that nobody has had issues in the department. And I'm horrified to think that we would do something like this. I text um, a relative of mine that works for Beaumont and they're not approving, ma making it mandatory yet either because it's not fully approved by the FDA. I, th I think with you being the chief, and, and I think um, this department, um, from what I've seen of all these people, you have a good crew. Um, how many total do you have? You said 20 are vaccinated out of how many? Roughly, it's roughly half of our department. It's about half. Interestingly enough, that seems to be the argument yeah. across the country. And I know that um, even in my own house, we have one vaccinated and one not vaccinated. Um, Probably 50% here. I, I just, I think if, as a department, if the guys want to do that, the guys and gals, that's gender neutral, sorry. Um, I, I'm on the side that that's an individual. I, I just can't imagine living in a world where somebody's forced to do something. And yes, I've heard the arguments we should follow the science. Well, I've actually talked to some people personally in the medical field that have said it's DNA altering. That we shouldn't be doing it. I've heard arguments about which one you get or don't get. Um, and at the same time, I was vaccinated with a polio vaccine, which was um, proven and mandated in order for us to get into public schools. But you didn't have to go to public school if you didn't want to do that. So, I, I mean, I understand that there's a lot of feeling there. I, I do have an issue when somebody says follow, follow the science because that's usually followed. Well, but don't listen to that science, only listen to this science. And, and so I have some issues with that. Um, we have retainage issues already, and if we can't, if you're forcing people to take them, they're, you're going to have people that aren't going to work here. Well, and and, and we don't need lawsuits. I, no. I guess I, th this is a tricky one because you've got the 20 that were vaccinated that would like to have the rest vaccinated. Then you have the 20 that weren't vaccinated that think the 20 that got vaccinated. Interestingly enough, I haven't heard too many people that aren't vaccinated disrespecting those that are vaccinated. I have seen it the other way around. But there's been so, I mean, we heard that the vaccine was gonna be no more masks. Now they're saying vaccinated people should wear the masks. And that they're still getting COVID. And, and you have, they're still spreading it. You had I'm five not. out of six people, that group out of Texas, that were all vaccinated, came to Washington, D.C., and five out of six of them got COVID. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much out there, I just don't know that it's an area that we should be in. But. Um, it's certainly a board decision. Um, we've heard from three. Mr. Gamka. Well, I agree with the comments stated. I don't need to restate everything, but I'm pretty much on the same page as, as the rest of the board here. Okay. So I guess the motion to not adopt the policy for a mandatory... Um, I, I don't think we even need the motion either. No. We're not going to approve it. I mean, if somebody well, made a motion well, and it didn't get supported, then it was be dead. no motion that I heard. It no, but we should discussion. make a motion to not adopt it. Yes, that's where I was at. Yeah. Oh. Making a motion to not adopt um, the policy for the mandatory COVID 19 vaccination. I would support. Motion by um, Shai Snyder, support by Winchester. To not approve? Correct. Okay. I mean, we could make it to approve and then everybody vote no. It'll get you the same result. I just wanted to keep straight what we had on the table. Um, all in 
favor say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries to not support. I'm playing with the double negative. I had to make sure which way I think it I I respect all of your decisions. This is a this is why we have a democracy and this is what the board works. No, I, I appreciate that, that it was, was handled. Me as the administrator looking at something from my point of view and doing what I do to try to um, do what I think was best no, I think for the department and, and that's fine. I, I think the beauty of this was there wasn't any argument. I mean, there wasn't no, any heated not, discussion. Uh, we talked about it and we're there. So, and, and as an elected official, I always know that it really leaves. I, I walk out the door with some people happy and some people aren't. I, I've yet to find anything that made 100% in agreement. So, I even remember somebody or complaining that we wished everybody Merry Christmas at a board meeting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you think? Okay, um, we're down to public comment. Oh, okay. no, no, we're not. We have another <laughs> agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Full-time Employees International Association of Firefighters. Tim Seals ready to throw something at so as I advised the board uh, a couple of months ago, the full-time staff was uh, organizing um, under the IAFF. Um, all of the initial uh, voting and all that goes with that has been completed. Um, I'm going to throw this to Captain Seal because he has uh, been elected or appointed the president of the new um, IAFF. 346 for North Open County Fire Authority to uh, let the board know what to expect and how this operates and what the process is. So. If I could, and Mr. Seal, I apologize up front, but um, I'd like to call for a five minute recess. Uh, Mother Nature dictates that I do that. So if you would make your apologies. No issues here. I know the feeling. That's the new station one, by the way, because the bathrooms are all the way down the hall across <laughs> the building. <laughs> Just say that's the long run of Mother Nature calls. George. Upstairs. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. They're going down. Just put a promoter in your office. Oh, it says it's out of service. It's close to the public. What? So I went all the way upstairs for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are we still recording? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. To the public. So somebody sang or something. I'll tap. We won't hear that. I noticed the deputy also left. Do we need to wait for her to come back? Diane? Mm -hmm. I know the deputy clerk left. No. Did, we're still on. Okay. I didn't want to start if she. You're good. Okay. Mr. Seal. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm assuming you all got your introduction letters from the local. Yep. So, not a whole lot more from me need be said. Uh, 
if you feel any questions that you may have based on the introduction or just in general, feel free. What was the what was the results of the election? How many people voted? How many people are in this union? All full time employees. What is that? How many number wise? Seven. Seven, that's why I thought. What was the vote? Seven. All right. Seven four? Yes. All right. Um, all full time members with the exception of me. Oh. Yes. Okay. And just to clarify for public record, the vote was seven in favor. Yes. Well that's you, what I understood him. I know, seven. but you said seven four and I didn't want people okay. to confuse oh. us. <laughs> that there were four people opposed. <laughs> that's I was a little confused, honestly. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking, I know there weren't that eight, there aren't even that many, so. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? Union experience, background, where this is headed, how it works, and all that stuff. Yeah, all of the like Bob. All of the Bob. <laughs> so, I guess let me break the ice this way. They decided to organize. Was not at my doing in any way, shape, or form. I'll put that out there first. Uh, I was asked if I would be willing to be the union president and negotiate the contract. <clears throat> uh, at first, I really didn't want to. Uh, I've got many years of union experience in negotiating contracts. And I told them, you know, it's a lot of stress, it's a lot of work. It's, uh, you know. So after a long, lengthy conversation, I says, I'll give you a somebody else <clears throat> is going to need to step up. And, and I, I say that because, yes, I have experience. Yes, I've been through negotiations. I know the labor laws. I've been to all these classes for, you know, public acts and murders and para and all this stuff that you got to know about. But I'm not going to be here for the next 30 years. Um, you know, some of the younger guys that may be here for the next 30 years. I try to train the people that are here now like they're going to be me in 10 years. So this is your department up and coming. So I try to encourage that. Um, so that said, I am the president for the year. Um, I did put in the letter uh, requesting the negotiating committee uh, from the board. Our negotiating committee will be our executive board members, which are currently myself and their department. And I, I know a lot of people have a lot of preconceived notions <clears throat> when a group or an entity organizes into a union. Uh, the MPFFU and the IFF, which is Michigan Professional Firefighters Union, the International Association of Firefighters, has a long history um, of no corruption, similar to other unions. And when I go into a contract negotiation or I negotiate with an entity, I try to be fair and equitable. Um, everybody knows that we're not overly populated. We're not flush with all kinds of money. Um, so we just look for fair and equal pay. Do we base it off of comparables? Yes, as part of the contract negotiations, we'll pull comparables from other departments that are similar to us in population size and finances, and, and we'll look at that, uh, and then we'll try to come up with what's fair and equitable for the full-timers here. Um, there is, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, mediation. Anybody familiar with that term? Mm -hmm. Okay. So generally, if for some reason we get to an impasse and we end up in what's called mediation, when we go to mediation, there's a mediator that basically does a give and take and says, here, what do you think about that? And if both parties are still at an impasse in your file for Public Act 312 binding arbitration, um, and I'm sure you guys have maybe seen or heard of that before. They make the decision? Yes, and that's mm -hmm. why they call it binding arbitration. Right. Um, I know there was a binding arbitration award in Independence not that long ago. And I know that um, rumor has it that their um, elected officials were not thrilled with it. And understandable. Mm -hmm. So 
I would say our intent as a union is not to bankrupt any municipality in any way, shape, or form. Uh, however, just to make sure that we have fair pay, that the safety standards are met, that all the rules and laws that govern the fire service and the public exit are out there that we're on top of, and you know, creating a top-notch department with the, with the best uh, protection and everything for the employees that are committed to being. So do you present a contract? <clears throat> so generally what we will do, and, and I don't know your familiarity, but I have the membership right now putting together a, a list of 20 demands. So everybody will submit 20 demands, then I'll take those demands and I'll organize them into uh, one master list of demands. Okay? And then you guys will generally submit me your list of demands. Uh, and then we'll exchange a list of demands and then we'll sit down and we'll go over them and say, well, you know, that's an absolutely no, that, you know, maybe we can do that if you give us this, and you negotiate. So can you tell me what kind of things a municipality would have to demand? <laughs> no. Well, no, I'm trying. I'm bad poker I, I was just going to say, can you tell me what's in your hand? <laughs> I mean, that just, yeah. So, it's know, a good question, wrong person to ask. Right. Well, I mean, in the issue of fairness, a municipality is going to want to establish certain rules, regulations, working hours, um, and possibly performance requirements, uh, possibly requirements for promotion. Uh, you know, a lot of unions look to have promotion strictly by seniority. And there's a lot of good and bad with that uh, that I've seen throughout my career. Uh, now, on the bad side, it causes somebody that may sit on their hands knowing that they're going to walk out of here with the highest promotion if they just sit on their hands long enough. Well, as a union president, I was never a big fan of that. You know, if you're going to come and sit on your hands and don't progress, um, don't be surprised if the gravy train hits you on the way through. So. Yeah, that's what the problem is with some unions. Right. That's why they get a bad name. Right. It, it does, to some extent, make things easier on the chief uh, to where once a contract is implemented, the chief, somebody will come into the chief's office and say, hey, I would like to do that. And say, well, hey, here's your contract. What does it say? If it says you're entitled to it, I give it to you. If it says it's not, talk to your president. You know, what I used to call live and die by the sword. They have agreed that there will be one group negotiating on behalf of all seven. So that's basically what it comes down to. And so I do have one question. You said your negotiating team was going to be these four officers. Oh, yes. That puts us in an awkward position because we're outnumbered on the negotiating team by virtue of the Open Meetings Act. Okay. In order for us to put more than two people on the negotiating committee, once we put a third person on there, we're in violation of the Oak Meeting Act. That becomes a quorum. Okay. So that means our committee is only going to have two people on it for the negotiating part. Once the negotiating is done, then you go back to the full board to look at it. And the full board could make some changes and then have to go back to negotiation. And I know you understand this. So, fire chief, legal counsel, those are two other common parts of uh, negotiating committees. And sometimes uh, a lot of a lot of negotiating teams that I have dealt with in my history were generally the supervisor of a township and the finance director. Those were the only two people that we dealt with. So they had two, we had four, and then you know they'd bring their legal counsel in when it was needed, and then we'd bring ours in when it was needed, and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, as I was say, because if the four of you bring legal counsel, it's just the numbers. Before you know it, you got 20 people on each side of the table. Yeah, but, you know, the board's picking two people that they're given the authority to negotiate the labor contract. No, I understand. Yeah. I, just was, I was just pointing that out to the board. That yeah, I, I don't think the outnumbering's a concern because, you know, you're going to be learning, they're going to be learning. I'm going to be sitting there beating myself in the head. <laughs> Everything's going to come back with a board for a board, at a board level as well. Yes, so, and that's, so. that's what happens, yes. Well, so. I know that I, I talked to George about it earlier, and I thought that it should be a full board. 
but then with that said, then we would have to be taking minutes and you have to post and, and all that. So mm -hmm. that creates a whole other level of, of problem. Well, and then plus because it's negotiation, you end up going into closed session, coming back out of Right. It gets really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what will happen is the fire board representatives will come up with what they think is a fair and equitable working agreement. And then each one of those um, townships will take that working agreement back to their board of trustees for approval. Um, because it will impact the finances, not only of the authority, but sure. it will also impact the general fund finances as well. And fire authorities did get added to, uh, included in public act 312, finding arbitration of three years ago. So what does that mean? That just means that the authorities covered under 312 if there's an impasse when go to binding arbitration. But the objective is to not go down that road. Well, so our, does this go to the fire board for approval to send it to the townships for approval or how? Yeah, negotiate. That's the way I would see it, yes. Yeah, the negotiating committee would meet, come back to this board once this board approves, like anything else, once this board approved, then it goes to the two township boards. Yeah. So let's say you have a negotiating committee, just hypothetically, right, of a Holly Township representative and a Rose Township representative and the fire chief for guidance if you need it or whatever. They're going to negotiate, right? And then they're going to come back to their board at Rose Township and not necessarily in a public meeting, maybe in a you know, close meeting to talk about negotiations and possible demands, ratification of a contract, and everything else. Um, and then they're going to send you back with what they are, you know, willing to accept, not willing to accept, and say, all right, that's not going to happen. You go back and negotiate. Right. So. But where does the binding arbitration come in with the board? Uh, the binding arbitration comes in with the board as if. So if you're doing your due diligence with going back to your boards and both boards say, hey, no, no, we're not buying any of this, right? Well, then you file for mediation, and then the mediator goes through your impasses. And then the mediators will pull comparables, they'll look at the financials, they'll do everything else like everybody else does. And they'll say, well, you know, it looks like you guys can afford this. Uh, comparably, they're not asking for too much on this side, they're pretty low, or they're asking for way too much for the status of where they're at now, on and on, and try to um, resolve uh, and come up with the working agreement. And if you can't do that, and then both sides decide that we're not talking about this anymore, we're at an impasse, then one side can file for arbitration. And you get scheduled, and they hear witnesses, and then they pull all the financial records. Uh, they pull the list of comparables. Every, pull, everybody makes their case. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. and the arbitrator will pull a lot on their own. Mm -hmm. Just to look. And, you know, and then they gather everything, they gather the testimony, and then they go back in the chamber and they make a final decision and issue the arbitrator's ruling. So who pays for the mediation and the arbitration? Both sides. So, you know, mediation, arbitration, yeah, it can get expensive. Based yeah. on the fact that this has just been put into position, mm -hmm. how long before you have to have a contract signed? Is there a time frame? No. Okay. Not necessarily. So what are you expecting from us next? Uh, initially, just to let me know who your negotiating committee is. Yeah. And out of your negotiating committee, you'll probably select a lead negotiator. And if you have a lead negotiator, then at some point I will send over the list of demands and request orders. And once we get a list of demands from both sides, we'll say, okay, why don't we sit down, schedule some introductory meetings, and go through these demands and kind of get a feel of where we're heading. Thoughts of the board? Paul, you look like you're ready to say something. Well, I am. I was, I was thinking that maybe I would be willing to be on the board with George here. I mean, since you're supervisor, you said supervisor and a financial person, and I think we qualify for that unless someone else wants it, unless supervisor Diane wants us. I mean, I said with my suggestion, that's... 
I'm fine. I'm fine with you negotiating if you want to. That's, okay. I, I mean, how often? What kind of commitment? Hours, time frame? Is this going to be after hours? Uh, I'm assuming you're not doing it during your regular scheduled. You know. I don't know. What are we? What yeah, is this happening? Guys, I mean, most union contracts allow uh, release time for union business. Oh, well, they do. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially to the presidents. So. Cha-ching, <laughs> 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 cha-ching, cha-ching. I, I, I can bowl them for you, but I. I, I, I can't imagine it's going to be a. Huge I'm going to kind of pretty much. Look for your guys' guidance. You know, if you guys say, hey, this is a lot of work, I really want to put in this much work out of my office hours, let's do it during office hours, then we'll go to office hours. So just work with whoever's negotiating yeah. and go from there. Yeah, okay. Try it. Whenever is the most convenient. If people got a lot of time on their hands after hours and. And you're going to be doing this in the closed. Like, well, not yes. open to the public, private, closed, yeah. private. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. room. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't become public until we bring it back to the board. The boards. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm fine with that if somebody wants to make a motion. Well, can I ask one more question Certainly. about the uh, the fire chief being there and the attorney? I don't think we want to pay an attorney until we get, would, if we somehow get to the before um, mediation. I would then bring the attorney in because we have to pay for that. I was going to say, I think I'm comfortable with the, the attorney being on call. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, would That's like how to, I, right. I would like to find a labor attorney and that we can ask because I don't know anything about labor negotiations. Do you? A little bit. No. And everything. But, a little so bit. I would want mine, somebody. Mine comes from that side. Right, yeah, I think well, it should be at, at the I would end, want to, towards the end. John I don't Clark think they need to be ongoing. Thing. And I would like to go ahead and at least have somebody on call that we have yeah, questions that's what I said, on and call. things of this nature. And that's pretty and much the same thing we're going to do. I'm not going to bring a labor attorney in right away. I, I only bring them in when I know I need them. Well, and that's what I say. I think once we get to a point, I, before I bring it to the board, I'd like the labor attorney to look at it and say, yeah, you, you yeah. didn't leave yourself wide open anywhere. Then I can come to the or we can come to the board and say, we've had this looked at. The labor attorney says it seems like it works. And, well, so I, then I, what about the fire chief? What about him? Now, is he going to be a part of the committee? or No. Okay. It's just, just us two. Okay. okay. I just know. asking because... I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I'd like to ask one question before we make the decision. Were you wanting to be a part of that negotiating team? My thought is, I don't want to put you in that position because these are your guys. Right. Mm -hmm. so I, think I don't want to create an adversarial right. position, but at the same time, I wanted to know what your thought was. I'm on the fence with it. Uh, I don't mind. I mean, we're not like at odds with each other. No, so we specially so organized. He's got an office across the station for me now. Um, no. <laughs> I think that um, when you get into the nuts and They're bolts, building you a shed out back. <laughs> When you get into the nuts and bolts of negotiations, I mean, are you guys going to know if somebody has this demand, how that's going to impact the department? Well, that's, that's why, why that's why I bring that in. That's why I said I wanted to. I don't think I know. I don't know any organized department that doesn't have their fire chief involved. Okay. In it. Well, well, we, we, we but you don't have to be involved. To him, anything that we could refer things over to him. You guys can him. talk together. Yeah, they yeah. don't have to be in the negotiating, but he could be part of what yeah. the impact would be when you're right. negotiating. Exactly. And that's why I said I wanted his opinion because I didn't want to force him to be in an adversarial position, but I think his needs. information is valuable. Oh, absolutely. That's right. why I was asking what his Let me opinion is. If you give me a negotiating committee of two people, and that's a committee we're negotiating with, and you want to bring the fire chief in a negotiation meeting um, because he is your authority on the fire side, I'm not going to squawk about it. However, <clears throat> um, I will still continue to negotiate with the two of you because that is the committee. But if you want to bring him in for a recommendation, you're not going to bother that. That won't bother us. both successfully landed on that fence they were talking about. Yes. <laughs> so I would move to appoint uh, George Cullis and Paul Gamka to the 
um, what do you call negotiating. it? Negotiating. Negotiating committee, is that good? Doesn't have to be a bigger name? Township, Paul Gamka, Treasurer, Rose Township. Let's do roll call. Diane Scheib Snyder? Yes. Karen Winchester? Yes. Paul Gamka? Yes. George Cullis? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. Now we're at the end of new business. I can go to public comment. You guys don't have the typical paragraph on there, but I think what do we allow three minutes? And well, I would make a comment too. I, I, it's really disappointing that you know I've been on this board since 2012 that the the people that the full time people would feel compelled to go and form a union. There's seven of them. I mean, I don't know whether the um, this really looks poorly on our management on um, the. Um, of the fire board. I know that I've been on the board since 2012 and we have and whatever the chief has wanted we haven't given him and when we were talking up until this last time and even then that was we cut that back and we were crucified on social media or something whatever that because we cut back a little bit and it's disappointing to me that we that seven nothing that the people felt that 
that they had to go the way of a union. It seems to me they could have gone and, and gone other um, routes, maybe talked to the chief or things of this nature, as, instead of taking what I consider to be a drastic measure. Having said that, we'll make do with whatever we have. And, um, you know, my um, position has always been to try to do the best for everybody involved. I never wanted people to go and work for nothing or substandard wages, but we can't compete with West Bloomfield. We cannot compete. We are a smaller township. We have no industrial base. So what we have here, I mean, going forward, we have to consider as a board whether this is even a viable alternative. We have two financially weak townships here, Holly and Rose, and and can we put in, can we go ahead and um, have a first-class fire department, because the money, we do not have the industrial base. We have basically um, residential base. And, and, you know, and that's just my thought in reading all of this, and I'm certainly not. Uh, it's just disappointing, but, you know, be that as it may. How dare you make a comment that this is my issue? I agree. It's How dare you say that this, this is my creation? We've already given you all the money that you wanted over the years, and I understand that this is a that that this is and a bigger the bigger picture is that it is a difficult situation here um, in the state and nationwide, and there are it's hard to get people to do this. And but we went and we gave. You said we needed more money over there. I said we agree. When I came in here, they were making eight, ten dollars, whatever, and we agreed to do that. And we've. Uh, a, We've addressed that. I've, we've never turned you down on anything. We've given you all the money that you have needed or what you requested. And so that's what, that's my comment. This, but you did not. This is stemmed from you guys meticulously pulling out their anticipated wage for this next, for this current budget year. But we had given them so everything they wanted. So how is that my wanted. problem? No, how is this that was, my fault? This has been going on for years. At front, so what this said. So this is going on. We, we have given um, everything we had. There was we cut it by fifty thousand dollars out of this. So to say that we had one little disappointment and all of a sudden everything blows up on it. All right. I have public comment, sir. Start, start with a name and address, if you would, please. Yes, thank you very much. Frank and Glenn Noble, Frank Rowe, Holly, Rowe Township. Well, I'd like to uh, point out uh, several items, two items, please. I didn't make it to the previous uh, fire board meetings. But I, I something, something happened. Just you, you the board. Glenn, hang out while she gets you the microphone. Uh, you, the board, have not been giving due diligence to this fire department operation. I was surprised at that two meetings ago that the town that the fire authority developed a training session that they're selling services to outside fire departments. I would suggest that you everything you go before this board to give some cost benefit ratios. This this is a, this is a rural township. It doesn't need a a fire training entity to offer services outside. Uh, secondly, um, regarding uh, the recent issue, I haven't been, been involved in the professional service area, consulting engineers for municipal projects for the last 40 years. I was involved in the city of St. Clair Shores as, an, as a city engineer when asked me one that came in. I've also seen the UAW and the Teamsters try to reorganize professional services organizations. Any time that takes place, it reflects on the management. This gentleman's here talking about they're going to have a list of complaints. Were, 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 the, were these issues by the, by, the, by the fire department staff brought to the, brought to the administrator and brought to the board? Uh, it's so sad that this has got to this position. Um, so additionally, you, you, you're going to live with what you got. But I'll tell you what, when you negotiate, you don't know it yet. And the other dilemma here is that you have an administrator that has to work with these people every day, and then you want him on the negotiate committee? Do you even know what, has anybody ever presented that all the staff, what, what the complaints or problems are? And, and what, what do you, the township board, want now in this situation? 
So you, you reach a dilemma, and I suggest to the board, you start giving some more, more comments and analysis of cost benefits with any new enterprises coming up within this township. Because me, as a taxpayer, have seen this cost go up, up, up. I thank you for my time. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify one thing. Uh, Mr. Noble referred to it as complaints, and I think Mr. Seal had said it would be demands. There is a little difference in the definition of those two words, but thank you. Anyone else for public? Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Yes, sir. A little more kind-hearted uh, situation. We are having a touch truck event tonight at Holly Academy. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, having such a truck event. Start with your name, please. Uh, Scott Blasco. Thank you. For the record. Good. Lieutenant. Uh, so, yes, we're having that event tonight. It's, uh, we invited Benton City, Springfield Township Fire Department, and Holly Village. I'll basically, take some apparatus out there, or something kind of like in a community event for Holly. Um, that's tonight from 6 to 8. And then um, I'll be sitting down with Chief Wentz, and we'll have the uh, open house date chose for you guys' next meeting, which will be held in Station 3 in Rose Township this year. So, Fire Prevention Week, yes, it'll be during that week. Where is this event tonight? Tonight's at Holly Academy on Fish Lake Road. Yep. Or Fish Lake and Academy, sorry. Anyone else for public comment? Not appearing if there are no more comments before this. You can't say not appearing and be looking down at the table. That's not fair. I looked over there. Nobody wanted a public. You've already spoken. I thought you were done. That was my time on the agenda. <laughs> so, with a couple things. Well, now wait a minute. If you're going to do this, you got to do it right. Start with your name. Timothy Seal. <laughs> 459 Riverside Drive. Some of the things that have taken place, I, you know, I see some frustration and some, some, some stuff. So maybe if I may um, explain it to you as follows, so maybe some of that gets buried. Uh, he, he did correct. It was a list of demands, not a list of complaints. Um, the system by which we <clears throat> um, have our board meetings at one point we would get reports from, you know, a captain or the training officer or something, but that became that it wanted to be on the agenda now, um, and that kind of got silenced to some extent. So our only avenue for gripes, grievances, uh, pay raises, issues, is the fire chief, okay, because he is the department head. By organizing into union, this now effectively gives us what we call as employees a voice at the table. We're not just negotiating or trying to help the chief see our needs, our demands, you know, because the, the chief's an administrator, right? He's not going to sit down and listen to Tim Seal say, hey, we need another $60,000 for one time here because as an administrator, what's he going to say? My budget can't handle that. Or he's going to go to the townships and beg for money because we had an overage in a budget somewhere. That's hard sometimes, right? And sometimes that puts a lot of weight on him personally trying to be a good financial manager. So now that we have a voice with the board and not just the chief, we feel that we are talking to all parties involved and negotiating with all parties involved. I don't think any of this was a direct result of not getting raises. Uh, the majority of our membership is uh, pretty, pretty good people. Yeah, I've heard about this coming about for a couple years now. Am I not correct in stating that? You know, maybe there's been, um, I've been asked a couple times about organizing, and my statement to them has been this every time. That is a decision for you guys to make. I have worked in a union. I have been a union steward, a union president, a union secretary. I have done my time in the union. The decision is your guys' to make whether you feel the need to organize. I'm not telling you one way or another. 
You guys as a whole, figure it out. If I'm offered to be part of a union, obviously, I would vote yes. So. Is that it? Uh, oh, one more comment, and that had to do with the training part. Um, I, I get what the comment was, and I understand it to a point. However, the biggest thing is we have very qualified people to do the training. Um, the departments out here that were doing the training, i.e. Highland, stopped doing it. Um, several other departments have stopped doing it. There are now only three academies in Oakland County. Us, Northeast, and OCC. When we started our grant uh, for the recruitment and retention, we put 20 people through that system. One of the things that was a benefit to us, because it wasn't in the grant, is we got to run 28 people through a fire academy that cost each person, the department, each person, fourteen to $1,600 per. We got to run them through the academy without seeing that cost. So that was a huge savings. So if we eliminate doing our own training and our own savings to ourselves on top of training other departments and covering, completely covering the cost, right, of what we do. I'm talking to structure wages and everything. It's completely covered. And then sometimes there's extra. So all that's covered. If we stop doing that, each person we bring in and sponsor to academy is going to be a $1,600 bill to the, to the department. So. Not to mention the lack of training that they get from right. other, because mm -hmm. I, mean, I took mine through Highland and it's, and I also teach with ours and it's a night and day difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have instructors that care and actually want these people to succeed versus just going through the motions, it's a big difference. I, I have talked to people outside of this board and outside of this department and I have heard nothing but positive about our training. Well, we should have it set up so that we can do it in terms of uh, a, um, you know, dollars and cents way so that we can do, in effect, have some sort of income statement or something like this to see how much it is costing us and how much we're looking at. Uh, if I may, you have that. The chief will give you anything you want. Uh, both instructors that run these academies, we develop our own budget, we submit it to the chief. Um, we keep track of our income and expenses, our overall costs, plus a fee for utilizing the building, uh, almost on a subcontract basis. So I'm sure if you ask the chief, he'd be more than happy to give you whatever you want to make. Mm -hmm. It's been running like that the whole time. He demanded that it ran like that the whole time. So when people come from other departments, those departments pay for that training? A reduced fee because um, to the fireworks funds through the state of Michigan, being an instructor in... I, I would spend hours with you guys telling you what that means in the state of Michigan, in the fire marshal, in the fireworks taxes out there. Now it turns into fireworks funding and it's allotted to uh, each county in the state based on population gets so much. Our county gets about 153000 to be used directly for fire training. Now the county training commission, of which I'm the representative of our department, and I go down to Oakland County to decide how to spend these funds, uh, has opted to fund three fire academies. They almost took it away and just funded one, which would have been OCC, right? So they're funding three. I'm sorry, Farmington Hills is another one. Um, so they're covering, they fund us at 12, $16,225, $16,225. The actual cost to run the academy, if we do it properly and get them what they need, we're somewhere in the area of $26,000, $27,000. So now we develop the cost based on that funding that comes in uh, for sponsored, non-sponsored. For non-sponsored, they're paying for a sponsorship, they're paying only like $1,200. If you're sponsored, I think the last time it was $450 per student from a sponsor, right? So they're paying us $450 to send their people to get quality training versus going to OCC and paying $1,600. So that funding offsets a cost significantly, um, and that's all laid out in the budgets that we I think. I think any time you deal with public funds and you have a, a citizen that raises a question like that, the best response are the facts. Mm -hmm. The best response is to be able to say, here's what we're looking at. Here's what the cost would be without it. Here's what it saves the department and, and address it that you way. Said the chief is a very financially, a very financial pain in the rear end. How is that to put it? 
So he requests these budgets, and he requests a percent for this. And if you're not going to meet it, you're not running the class. Why don't you just put this on the budget for some numbers and some discussion? You mean on the agenda? I thought we already did I'm sorry, this. on the agenda for next. Okay, I just want to clarify. I mean, we're going, and this is public comment time. Yep. yep. Yeah. We propose, and we also submit a final. So you get both of so, I mean, if, if you want to see the numbers and have some discussion, that's something we can discuss as a board. Anything else to come before this board? Then I will call the meeting at 418. What did you use? What? What did you use? Your knuckles. Well, you wouldn't let me use the illustrious 